Well, good morning and welcome everyone. Um, we are so happy to have you join us this morning. Um, I am Helen Young. I am the project director for the California Community College Transfer Guarantee to Historically Black Colleges and Universities. And today we begin our week of HBCU celebration. As you know, this project has been in existence now moving into about our sixth year. Um, of really making some a major headway um, with relationships with our HBCUs. And so this week we are doing all things HBCU in celebration of the um, contributions that these amazing institutions have not just made for the African-American black communities, but for the nation um, in, in, in its entirety. So today we are kicking off with our HBCU uh, panelists who are two amazing researchers um, and historians, specifically looking at HBCUs. So let me let me read you their amazing um, bios and introductions. Our first panelist today is Dr. Cheryl E. Mango. She is an assistant professor of history at Virginia State University and HBCU in Petersburg, Virginia, and one of our partner HBCU institutions. She received national recognition for creating the first curriculum, curriculumized HBCU history course known, known as History 349 at Virginia State University. She is also the founding creator of the HBCU Studies Academic Discipline. She provides the philosophical and practical basis for HBCU Studies in her upcoming article in Dican the Journal of HBCU Leadership titled Black College Res uh, Res uh, Renaissance. My decision to create the first HBCU history course and 2020 proposal for interdisciplinary HBCU studies curriculum. Emasa, Dr. Mango completed her undergrad degree in history and political science at Grambling State University, another one of our partner institutions, an HBCU in Louisiana and her master's degree in history at Louisiana Tech University. In 2016, she received her PhD in history at Morgan State University, an HBCU in Baltimore, Maryland, with a concentration in African studies, African, uh, African um, uh, diaspora, and the 20th century U.S. history. While a doctoral student, she interned at the White House Initiative on Historically Black Colleges and Universities in Washington, D.C. during the Obama administration, which helped to shape her research specialization. Dr. Mango, research interests concern, concern HBCU systems analysis, particularly black college innovation, functionality, and sustainability, American president relationships with black colleges, and third, the history of federal private funding to HBCUs. One of her latest publications focus on black colleges and the American presidency title, The HBCU Revolution, Desegregation, Dis Disintegration, Collaboration, and Jimmy Carter's 1980 decision to give black colleges their own White House office. The article is scheduled for upcoming publication in the Journal of Federal History, and Dr. Mango creates credits the opportunities of her parents' HBCU education provided to her family for driving her professional dedication to the institutions. Welcome, Dr. Mango. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Our Thank next you. panelist is just as distinguished is Dr. Jelani M. Favors, an associate professor of history at Clayton State University. It's in Monroe, Georgia, correct, Dr. Favors? Monroe. Monroe. He received major fellowships in support of his research that include an appointment as a Humanities Writ Large Fellow at Duke University in 2013, and he was an inaugural recipient of the Melanin HBCU Fellowship at the John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute at Duke in 2009. In 2014, he was invited to co-teach a course titled Citizenship and Freedom, the Civil Rights Era alongside Pulitzer Prize winning historian Taylor Branch of the University of Baltimore. In 2018, his essay titled Race Women, New Negro Politics and the Flowering 
of radicalism at Bennett College, one of our partner schools, from 1900 to 1945. And it won the RDW Connor Award as the best article published in the North Carolina Historical Review for that year. In 2019, Dr. Favor released his first book, which we are excited to talk about today, entitled Shelter in a Time of Storm, How Black Colleges Foster Generation of Leadership and Activism, which was published by the University of North Carolina Press. And I actually ordered mine, Dr. Favors. Should be arriving very soon. Help my research. The book has received high praise from reviewers and has reset the narrative of the legacy of black colleges as incubators of student activism and leadership. Shelter in a Time of Storm was the recipient of the 2020 Stone Book Award presented annually by the Museum of African American History in Boston. It has also won the 2020 Lillian Smith Book Award given yearly by the Southern Regional Council and the University of Georgia Libraries. And it is also one of five finalists for the 2020 Polly Murray Book Prize presented by the African-American Intellectual History Society. Dr. Favors' research and commentary has appeared in several media outlets, including CNN, C-SPAN, The Washington Post, Market Watch, The Atlantic, The Chronicle of Higher Ed, and The Conversation. He's earned his PhD in history from Ohio, the Ohio State University, where he earned an MA in African American Studies. He is a graduate of North Carolina A&T University, where he earned a bachelor's degree in history with honors. Dr. Favor is a native of Wisdom Salem, North Carolina, and currently resides in Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome, distinguished panelists. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so today, um, for those joining us today, what we're the, the the setup and the format for today is Dr. Favors and Dr. Mango are going to Mango, excuse me, is going to give us a presentation um, that'll last about 20, 30 minutes. I'm going to ask them very specific questions surrounding their research, um, and then we're going to open it up to the chat room. So please use the chat room on your right hand side to put your questions in. Dr. Karen McCord, who is my right-hand woman in, North Carol in, in Northern California, um, will be also helping me to manage that chat area. Um, and so as you uh, finish, as we finish up with the presentation portion of it, we will go back into the chat and we will answer, um, we'll send the questions or direct the questions to either Dr. Mango or to Dr. Favors, or if you want either one or both of them to respond to your questions, um, that's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Mango, and we're gonna get started. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> so first of all, before I begin, I would just like to take this opportunity to thank you for inviting me here, uh, 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 specifically uh, Miss Young, for all the assistance, all of the emails, all the energy, and just for having this fantastic program on behalf of Historically Black Colleges and Universities. So today, briefly, uh, my presentation, my 20 uh, to 30 minute presentation, uh, will include a theme. Um, and that theme is uh, centering HBCUs and, uh, as a great American story. <clears throat> Oftentimes, it seems that there's a disconnect between uh, what it means to be American and the African-American experience or struggle. But I argue and my position today is that uh, HBCUs are actually a great American story despite historic and pervasive inequities. So again, I am Dr. Cheryl E. Mango. I'm an assistant professor of history at Virginia State University and HBCU. Uh, in Petersburg, Virginia. Uh, I'm a graduate of two HBCUs that she mentioned, Grambling State University in Louisiana for my bachelor's and Morgan State University for my PhD. Um, and so she went over my research specializations and hopefully um, I will be able to chime in on those uh, later in the program. However, uh, it's important that I note that, um, that HBCU and 
the American presidency, which is my uh, area of research, have a very particularized relationship. And it's one that is very obscure. It's one that's ambiguous. And it's one that I'm happy uh, to be able to uh, discuss in my research and, and moving forward and, uh, and popularize. But nevertheless, Today, my goal is to kind of give you an overview of HBCU history. Uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Favors, will be uh, discussing the more nuanced areas of HBCU history. But it's important that we set a narrative about HBCUs because I think that they're still very misunderstood uh, institutions. Oftentimes, we hear about Black colleges and recently, uh, we saw them on presidential stages uh, as major elements of presidential platforms. And I was very happy about that because that's actually my research area. Um, and I had the pleasure of working in the only, uh, in the first White House office that was dedicated to any particular set of schools, which was the White House Initiative on HBCUs, which many uh, people don't understand the history of that office and how that office came to exist. But that office came to exist because, in, in a way, and it follows the same trajectory of the African-American experience and particularly of what we see as characteristics of a great American story. So we always hear this term, uh, great American story. But what is the characteristics of a great American story? And how do we center HBCUs and understand HBCUs as a great American story so we can continue them? Okay, so I argue, and, and today my position is that what constitutes a great American story is challenge. Oftentimes we hear about challenge, uh, having to overcome some type of struggle and having the courage to overcome this struggle. So those characteristics kind of involve what we see as a great American story, and certainly they involve uh, they involve the characteristics of HBCU history. Also, in a great American story, we hear about counteracting some type of challenge, counteracting the struggle, counteracting uh, the uh, adversities uh, that may arise, and certainly. Um, counteraction is something that HBCUs are, have been very, very keen at, at, at doing. Um, and, and what are they counteracting? Okay, and a lot of it is the, the historic and pervasive inequities that African Americans face, okay? Um, also, innovation. Another element of what constitutes a great American story is One's ability to innovate, to be entrepreneurial, and to innovate with conservative and meager resources oftentimes. Um, that's kind of some things that we celebrate when we discuss what a great American story is. And I assure you that HBCUs definitely have been innovative with very meager resources. Um, also, triumph, okay? Their ability to overcome and have successes uh, and challenges, okay, and challenges, uh, but so they can offer some type of reward. So we celebrate these stories in America of triumph, count, struggle, challenge, and then and a, a reward. We like that as Americans. We like to see this type of reward, okay? And oftentimes the reward comes for HBCUs come and two formats of people. It has real life implications of people like me. Um, my mother was telling me uh, about her limited opportunity. My mom and dad, their limited opportunity. They didn't have, they grew up during the time of segregation. They didn't have any other opportunity but to attend an HBCU. Um, and so they opted to attend Gremlin. And luckily my father, uh, play football under the legendary coach, Eddie Robinson, was able to get an a, a NFL contract and, you know, came out of poverty to, you know, in this story, my story is the story of so many black people in America. And so, again, this is a part of the great American story that HBCUs have. And oftentimes in a great American story, it's not just about the reward and the success, it's about replication. 
So the story that I mentioned about myself has been replicated over and over and over again by way of these schools. And oftentimes, lastly, a great American story is anchored in history, in a deep, rich history, a deep, rich legacy. So today, briefly, I wanted to set the stage because I want to discuss HBCUs in that context. And HBCU, an introductory uh, uh, knowledge of HBCU history within the context of a great American story, okay? Now, but when we deal with the great American story, we talked about this challenge. So what is this challenge, okay? What is this challenge that HBCUs face? Well, one of them is that they're rooted in two different Americas. They're rooted in two different Americas. And if you notice here on my screen, you will see that uh, an article that says that Harvard has the largest endowment in the world, okay? Whereas Cheney University and HBCU, okay, in Pennsylvania, is, is struggling to keep its accreditation, okay? Now, having a lot of financial cha uh, challenges. And, and I must say that yes, HBCUs are great institutions. They produce Kamala Harris. They produce Martin Luther King. They produce Stacey Abrams. They produce Eddie Robinson. They produce Booker T. Washington, W.B. Du Bois. And the list goes on and on. Thurgood Marshall, Kwame Nkrumah, okay? They did. But it is some challenges that these schools had to face in light of that production. And so as we talk about HBCU history and we begin to understand why they are so important, why it's important that we study them, why it's important that we support them, we'll begin to understand that these are a great American story, that they re reflect the great American story. However, due to this pervasive inequality, this structural inequality that they faced from the beginning, okay? Stamped from the beginning, okay? That's been a, a famous term lately with the success of the great book. But what is the difference between Harvard and Cheney? Now, Harvard was the first institution in America, first you know, predominantly white institution in America. Whereas Cheney was the first black institution in America. Harvard founded in 1636, Cheney in 1837. But their pictures are vastly different. And what is the difference between their pictures? Okay, their financial pictures, their recognition, how they're received, their prestige, okay? And, and should we rethink this as we explore and as we examine HBCU history, okay? Because with nothing almost, and under the, in the environment of slavery, schools like Cheney University had the task of turning the formerly enslaved into African-Americans. Now, that's a very difficult task. Just think of that. Just think of having to do that, turning the formerly enslaved into doctors and lawyers and and into the black middle class, okay? Into the vanguards of America, into the moral conscience of America. That's a very difficult task that most PWIs did not necessarily have to do. And they, if they did it, okay, they did it with resources, okay? But we see the outcome of this, okay? We see the outcome of this structural inequality, okay? But yet, Cheney still manages to produce, okay? But what's the difference? What's the difference between these two institutions if it's not for the racism and not for the structural inequality, okay? So, yeah, I just wanna show you here, I'm gonna move to, uh, and I guess here I'm talking about HBCUs as a great American story. And right now I'm getting, I'm, I'm discussing the challenge. I'm discussing the, the tough element of it. I'm not talking about them in a celebratory tone yet. We haven't reached that element 
of the great American story yet. I'm getting there, but I'm not there yet. So this is tough. This is tough. But if we're going to have critical analysis about HBCUs, we need to understand them in their authentic genuine context. These schools did not just do miraculous things just because they had all the resources and all the support in the world. No, they did these miraculous uh, things uh, in spite of having all of these issues and challenges and having, and, and having to carry the whole black community and, and largely, in a large part, America in many ways, helping them repair the wartime Civil War South, okay? Having to put all of that on their backs with limited support and under very, very strict political and racial etiquette, these schools had to do this, okay? But nevertheless, I want to deal with, so again, I'm not at the happy part of the story yet. I'm in the struggle, okay? I'm in the challenge. We have to understand this. This is the next, if we're going to really study HBCUs, we need to see them in their correct and situate them and centralize them in, uh, in, their, in an accurate context, okay? Now, yes, they did all of these wonderful things, just as African Americans have, but let's look at the history. Let's look at the history that these schools emerge out of. So we had the 1607 founding of Jamestown, Virginia. In 1619, the first Africans brought to North America uh, to Jamestown, okay? Then we had 1636, Harvard University is founded. 1776, American Independence. 1837, the first HBCU was founded. 1865, the ending of slavery, the beginning of Reconstruction. 1877, the ending of Reconstruction. Uh, the Plessy versus Ferguson decisions, which legalized separate but equal. Okay, the 1954 Brown school, making school segregation illegal. Then you had the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now I'm gonna, inside of that context, I, I, I just wanna put it to context because oftentimes African-Americans and HBCUs, we can make the struggle look good. <laughs> or we can make our struggle look real good. But in actuality, it has been very difficult. Just because we did it with style, <laughs> just because we did it with grace, it doesn't mean that it's not difficult. But the point that I'm trying to make here, okay, is that I'm not a mathematician, but the point that I want you all to take away is that HBCUs emerge out of a reality where only 69 of 402 years of black people being in this country since 1619, has the law legally recognized us and, and protected us as equal? 12 years during, and this is a very nuanced argument, but it gives you an overview, okay? I can argue with my colleagues about whether, but it gives you an overview of the, the, the environment that HBCUs emerge out of. So 12 years during Reconstruction, we had the law somewhat recognizing us as, as, as equal uh, participants in this society somewhat, okay? Men in particular, so this is very nuanced. And then, sorry, that should say 2021, but we have about 58 years if, since 2021, since Dr. King in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 of having those protections those federal law protections uh, really ingrained in our society. Not people's perceptions of us, but just the law. So in total, 69 out of 402 years that African-Americans have been in this country reflects the total combined years of the federal law recognizing African-Americans as equal. Again, this is nuanced, but HBCUs emerged out of this devastating reality. So how in the world do we have a Martin Luther King? Do we have a, a Dr. Jelani Favors? A, a how, do, how in the world do we have a Thurgood Marshall and a Langston Hughes and the list goes on and on? How do we have this when you have a reality where less than 70 years, your government laws have recognized you as an equal participant 
in this nation. See, HBCUs emerged out of that reality. They emerged out of a, a very difficult reality, okay? Now, so this leads to the struggle. So HBCUs had to make the African-American. They assisted, see, we African-Americans, we are now class, this is a process. Being black and being African-American, this is a process. This is not something that just happened, okay? We didn't just wake up African-Americans. We didn't just wake up and, and, and be able to get in our Mercedes and Lexuses and, 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 and drink our coffee at, at Starbucks and you know go to Whole Foods and walk with our Whole Foods bags. We didn't wake up like that. It was a struggle. It was a process for us adapting languages like English to accept these names like Cheryl. This was a process. We came here as African. And, 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 the, and in this process right now in our journey, we're African-Americans. And HBCUs were largely responsible for our ability to make that transition from the formerly enslaved and enslaved to African-Americans. For us to be able to have the tools and, and, and resources necessary for us to compete in this society, and not only compete in this society, but for us to transcend and help us transcend in this reality and help us transform this society, okay? A wise man once said that without HBCUs, if HBCUs did not exist, someone would be trying to create them because the process of HBCUs making the African-American was a very, very intense process, okay? And it's one, like I said, we made it look good. We did it with style. We did it with the show bands. We did it with, with swag. We did it with not great food in the cafeteria. We did it with pride, okay? We did it with an impeccable dress, an impeccable means of speaking English. We did it that way, but it was not easy. Okay, to go from the formerly enslaved and to African Americans, this process, HBCUs provided the manufacturing, the laboratory to compute this. And you come in one way and you come out another way. So HBCUs have had a tall task of turning the formerly enslaved into African Americans. They began as Negro colleges before 1860. Only four Negro colleges existed as compared to close to 300 white colleges. Between 1861 and 1870, 28 Negro colleges existed, um, largely uh, promoted and assisted by the Freedmen's Bureau after the Civil War. Then you had the Morrell Act of 1890 that established 19 HBCUs. And currently, there are roughly about 107 HBCUs in existence. And the way that HBCUs got that designation was by the Higher Education Act of 1965 that defined HBCU as any historically black college or university that was established prior to 1964, whose principal mission was and is the education of black Americans. Um, and that is also accredited by a nationally recognized accrediting agency. And the reason why this distinction is important and had to come about as a result of the civil rights movement uh, and, and HBC was able to get more access to the federal dollars that the white institutions got. They was able to get research, uh, research money. They was able to have doctoral programs. They was able to have medical schools. They was able to have in mass. And HBCUs, the white, the accrediting boards and, and things of that sort, what, what it, they were very limited initially and still to this day in their course offerings as a result of this structural inequality, okay? This unwarranted, unfair, unjust structural inequality, yet they still managed to produce, okay? But nevertheless, this 1965 designation of HBCU, uh, of historical black colleges was important because you do have some institutions that might have a larger black, educate a larger black population than an HBCU, but they did not begin, like for example, Georgia State,
but they didn't begin as a school that was exclusively purposed to educate HB, uh, black students. So that's why we have these designations. But nevertheless, and I'm almost, I'm almost done. We're in a part of the struggle in HBCUs in the making of the African American. Okay, you had anti-literacy laws, particularly in Virginia, despite uh, that existed. That is that despite an effort to keep blacks illiterate the group was determined to receive an education. So although you have laws preventing black people from getting an education, this was a determination. Remember, we're talking about how did you make an African-American? How, and, and, and we're questioning where would we be without these institutions? Where would the society be? Where would African-Americans be? And what are the implications if they don't continue to exist? So we need to understand this history. Okay, so we talked about the endowments, okay? But nevertheless, HBCUs still managed to produce, and Dr. Favors will talk more about this, they managed to epitomize American bravery and courage and possibility, okay? They epitomized that uh, with all of their activism, all of the activists that they produced, okay? Not just in America, but globally, okay? Them providing a safe space to discuss issues of liberty and freedom, uh, of colonialism and imperialism, and what the world would be like in a post-colonialist uh, uh, and post-imperialist environment, okay? So HBCUs uh, should be seen as international institutions for their influence. Okay, and, 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 and I find it particularly problematic when we discuss black history that we don't really discuss HBCUs as they need to be discussed. We might discuss Martin Luther King or, or Booker T. Washington and K through 12 education, but we don't talk about the HBCUs that provided them uh, with the uh, space to cultivate their ideas, okay? So they epitomize encourage in innovation, okay? So HBCUs have been amongst the most innovative despite their structural inequality, despite the white accrediting boards having such a tight wrap around uh, in defining what success and black success meant, defining in, in, in many ways, okay? And, and, and defining in a, in a Jim Crow South, okay? Uh, and determining how much funding and, and, and determining how much uh, opportunity, determining these things uh, for HBCUs in many ways, okay? Despite that HBCUs and black people have managed to be innovative, okay? Creating a unique black college culture that is replicated, that is, uh, idolized all across the globe. I went to Gramlin at home of the world fame, uh, Tiger marching band and, and, and our contributions to the NFL, the professional sports. So we've been in our campus queen culture. So HBCUs not only created a unique academic culture, but a unique campus culture, uh, as well as producing black doctors, black lawyers, Okay, and, and politicians, teachers, nurses, business owners, entrepreneurs, professional athletes, they did this. They put the black nation on their backs, okay? Now, so triumph, success in HBCU. So now we move moving to the triumph, okay? So it's a number of statistics out there about HBCUs and, and their actual, uh, their actual, uh, material value that they offer to uh, that they offer to their graduates. Okay, but you can say that in many studies have shown that black graduates from HBCUs assume higher status occupations compared to their same white race graduates because you are in a laboratory of black success. HBCUs are essentially micro nations. They are micro nations for that create a sense of sovereignty when you might have, you might not experience sovereignty outside of that micronation. 
But on the HBCU and campus, you're gonna be uh, entrenched in what black success would look like, what black leadership looks like, what what black what a black doctor looks like, what a black teacher, lawyer. This you're in a lab, a micronation of black success. Okay, so by the time you leave there, your self esteem is so ready. You're ready to encounter the world. Okay, you're confident. And so black graduates from HBCUs are socialized to higher status at, uh, occupations in college uh, because HBCUs affirm their racial and ethnic identity. I, I must tell you this, when I attended a PWI for my master's, I, was, I did not have the same experience in grad school than when I attended the HBCU. Our level of discussion, we weren't discussing whether or not racism existed, we was discussing how do we address it, how we how we were able to go in depth with it. So it's a different level of discussion. So when I came out, I was ready to create the first HBCU history class. I was ready. I, I was ready to create a new academic discipline uh, centered on HBCUs because of my preparation at an HBCU, because of my level of freedom in our discussion. OK, so in terms of we're going towards the end of the story. HBCUs as a great America story. In terms of the reward and replication, it's interesting that this office, the White House Initiative, on his so how did HBCUs receive their own White House office? That's my main agenda. That is my main research question, my main research agenda. And one of the reasons why they received this White House office in 1980 is because of all of that struggle that they had to undergo. <laughs> Uh, uh, in training the formerly enslaved. Um, and it, this, they received their own White House office in uh, August of 1980 under the Carter administration. And ever since then, uh, they have, just like you have an attorney general office, you have a White House initiative, you have a White House office that's specifically tailored to HBCUs. Why did they get this office? Not in the 60s, but in the 1980s. Well, because of one issue. When the white institutions began by force, okay, uh, to uh, allow black students in in the 1960s and 1970s, that left HBCUs in a very precarious situation. And so the HBCU community rose up and they said, wait a minute, civil rights should not come at the expense of our institution. So you want us to close up, you're gonna try to, after y'all done discriminated against us, we done put America and the nation on our backs, the whole black community. Yes, okay, now y'all wanna go to PWIs, we understand that, but that shouldn't mean that we have to uh, close our doors. We need some protections. We need federal protections. We need federal set-asides. We need a policy office in the White House. We don't know not, don't put it in Congress, or in, although it's in the Department of Education now, but we want a presidential office. We want the president to define the future of HBCUs. And it just so happened that they did that under the Carter administration, which had a number of HBCU graduates. And so it was a perfect recipe for success. HBCUs became the first set of schools to have their own White House office, and now we have a number of successive uh, uh, the Alaska Native Americans now are following that same path. They have their own White House initiative, uh, uh, faith-based initiatives. But the White House initiative emerged out of that reality. It emerged out of a reality that HBCUs had had this great American story but now, are we, now that the PWIs are letting black students in, and black students, uh, and, the, and they have more money and more resources because the black schools was discriminated against all these years, and their people was discriminated against all these years. So now, all of a sudden, you mean to tell me the schools gonna close down? Oh no! So that's how they got their own White House office, and that's how the federal government started to give HBCU some type of redress for their struggle. 
And so that's when you see the rise of HBCUs in the 1990s. You see a golden era of HBCU history. Um, uh, everybody on Martin wearing HBCU t-shirts and everything. You see a golden age and H enrollments up at HBCUs. HBCU uh, expansion of graduate programs at HBCUs because of the federal investment in HBCUs that began in 1980 after they had had a, 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 a issue with the federal government because now that because of the white institutions now taking uh, a, a number of the enrollment at HBCUs. But nevertheless, and this map was not all the way accurate because we know we have Charles Drew in California. But we see that, as, as I conclude, we see this picture, and I want you to remember this, turning the formerly enslaved into African Americans. What other story is, a, is a greater as an American story than HBCUs? Okay, so we see this map of where HBCUs is located. They're located mostly in the South, okay, uh, 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 where slavery and what took place. So these schools are very much connected to that. And they had a very tall task of turning the formerly enslaved into, uh, into Stacey Abrams, into uh, Kamala Harris's, into uh, and the, you know, Spike Lee's, Oprah Winfrey's, Jesse Jackson's, and the list goes on and on of HBCU graduates, Tony Morrison. The list goes on and on of turning the formerly enslaved into African Americans. What other story as great as that? And why do we need, why do they need to continue to exist? Because they continue to produce. They continue to provide a safe space for, so we in the era of Black Lives Matter, we're talking about all of these issues, but we realize that HBCUs have emerged as the victors in African and American history. They are still here. They did not dissipate under the auspices of integration. They are still producing. They are still relevant. They are still in need of the community support the society support, and anybody who pledges allegiance for justice for all, it's time for HBCUs to not just receive redress from a White House, an obscure White House office, it's time for all of the country and in the international community who benefited from HBCUs to provide redress to HBCUs. And the way that uh, California community college students could do it is by enrolling in these institutions and being a part of this great legacy, this great American story. Come join us, be a part of this great American story known as Historically Black Colleges and Universities. So as I conclude, I would like you to take away three of uh, the following three points. HBCUs are a covenant that America and African Americans actually got right, I argue. I, I argue that it's something that, though we need some improvement, it's a covenant that is one thing that America actually did right and got right. You know, although their histories, um, they started off as mostly private institutions, but you did have the Freedmen's Bureau Memorial Act. But it's a covenant with America and with the nation and African Americans that actually worked. It needs a lot of uh, improvement. It needs a lot of uh, recollection, uh, recognition about the, and redress about the issues that HBCUs face and that the government uh, helped to perpetuate on HBCUs. But they actually, it's, a, it's something we actually did right. They have emerged as victors in the African-American experience, I argue. However, we must understand that HBCUs emerged out of a tragic 400 year history of extreme abuse, okay? Discrimination, mistreatment, and severe funding inequities. So not only were these schools facing discrimination, they had to produce graduates, as Dr. Favors will talk about, who challenged these issues. But that I'm focused more on the issues that the schools face themselves, okay? So they had to, they had to, to deal with their own challenges and, and also put the uh, country on their backs to help us not fall apart, to help us define 
and get to this idea of what America is. And lastly, an HBCU education provides benefits that far outweigh the recognition and redress that the institutions deserve. So I'm arguing that yes, we are coming to into knowledge and, and accepting. I'm so happy. California has been one of our most progressive states over the course of our history. And I'm so happy that you all have this agreement and have this office. But this office that you all are leading and setting a trend with having an HBCU specific office, this should be replicated across the nation in an in international office with all of the, all of the, uh, all of everything that HBCUs have produced. So I conclude and I leave you on that note that HBCUs are a great American story despite pervasive inequalities. I didn't even see that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Mango. Wow, you are one powerhouse of a woman. Um, just so glad to know you are leading the charge. Um, Dr. Favors, it's all yours. Your stage yeah, is yours, for sir. Me. Um, I don't have a presentation to give. Um, I'm going to be very succinct in my comments, and hopefully we can move to uh, some discussion, if we have it, from um, those who are, who are in the audience listening. Uh, first, I want to thank Helen uh, um, for extending the invitation. It's an honor to um, be with you on the West Coast. I'm not sure if it's afternoon or morning there yet. I, I, believe, it's, I believe it's just, it's almost afternoon <laughs> when you are. So um, thank you um, for having yeah. me. Uh, as I've been telling folks all day, happy Aggie Pride Day. Today is... February the 1st, uh, as uh, Helen mentioned, I'm a graduate of North Carolina a t State University, a proud graduate of North Carolina a t State University. And we uh, often refer to this as Aggie Pride Day because on February 1st, 1960, 61 years ago, four young freshmen uh, from North Carolina a t State University stepped out uh, and launched the sit-in movement. Uh, and that sit-in movement exploded across HBCUs, across the South. Uh, and in doing so, it, it vaunted and, and, and lifted uh, the civil rights movement into the direct action phase of the movement. So HBCUs have been a critical part of, of our history. Um, as I say, and this is uh, my book, Shelter in a Time of Storm, How Black Colleges Fostered Generations of Leadership and, and Activism. Uh, it's, it's done very well, but more importantly, um, it has, I think, reset that narrative on why HBCUs are so important. If you had to boil that book down um, to one phrase, uh, and one phrase alone, it would be that space matters, right? And, and this echoes really a lot of what Dr. Mango uh, has just mentioned, that, that space was at a premium, right? And so um, you look at, at, at Cheney State University, which was founded as the Institute for Colored Youth, uh, 1837, uh, as she mentioned, is, is when that institution was founded. Fast forward the clock a few years later, you have Lincoln College uh, um, being founded. It started off as Ashman Institute. Uh, also in, in Philadelphia. Uh, and then you have, of course, Wilberforce in Ohio. Those three institutions existed during that antebellum period. Uh, let's be very clear about this uh, and let's debunk this myth. Um, the North was no paradise for black folks. Um, black folks who had escaped to, to freedom uh, within the North often found themselves oppressed, often found themselves fighting to be free. And so again, space mattered. It was essential uh, to them. And so HBCUs, since their uh, inceptions, have really kind of provided that type of space. I went to graduate school at, at Ohio State University, uh, and it was there that uh, two things happened that really kind of transformed uh, my thinking and my thought on thoughts on, on how we should address black colleges. Um, one, I took a class under Dr. William Nelson Jr., who also was a graduate of, of an HBCU. He was a graduate of, of Arkansas Pine Bluff, but he was one of my mentors at Ohio State University. And I'll never forget um, taking Dr. Nelson's class at Ohio State. I was, he used to teach classes on political movements. Uh, and, and Dr. Nelson would lean back in his chair. Uh, and at times he would often seem as though he was even asleep sometimes while we were all engaged in conversation. Um, but all of a sudden, Dr. Nelson would spring to life um, in these seminars that we would have as graduate students. And he would often pose this one singular question to us. Um, as his students. And that question would be, whatever it was that we were talking about, he would say, what does this have to do with the liberation of black people? And, and he, he would say it over and over again, so much so that we began to joke 
not in front of him, but behind his back, we would begin to joke and call it the Nelsonian question, right? What does this have to do with the liberation of black people? Right? And so I thought about that in my own work moving forward is if, if I'm going to begin to talk about black colleges and HBCUs, one of the things that I want to do is answer that central question. What do these institutions have to do with the liberation of black people? And the other seminal moment in my graduate education was taking a class um, called The History of Black Education, taught by the great Dr. Beverly Gordon at Ohio State University. And it was there that she exposed us to the canon, right? She exposed it to all of these books that had been written um, by different scholars. Uh, and, and so um, she, one of the books that she introduced us to uh, was a book called um, The White Architects of Black Education, um, written by William Watkins. It's called The White Architects of Black Education. And in that book by, doc, by Dr. Watkins, he raised this, this, this point where he suggested that um, black college students, um, as they entered into these spaces, uh, HBCUs, um, that they were being taught to be conformist, that they were being taught to be passive, that they were taught to be uh, um, willing players within a white supremacist system. And, and as a graduate student, you know, one of the things that we're taught to do is to think critically about the research that we're engaging in and the works that, we are being, that we're reading and being introduced to. Uh, and so as I read that book, I said, well, wait a minute, you know, if, if black colleges are, are, are they simply, if they're simply the white architects of black education and black students are being taught to be pacifist and, and to be uh, complicit with the white supremacist system, then how do we get Ella Baker? How do we get a Stokely Carmichael? How do we get a Martin Luther King Jr.? How do we get a John Lewis? How do we get all of these people who are being produced, um, these, these legendary figures and, and freedom fighters who emerged from these institutions beginning in 1837 and again, define HBCUs moving forward? And that question had never been fully answered for me. Um, as, as a student, even as taking the class, the history of black education, um, no one, and I think that, that Dr. Mango really kind of touched on this, no one had really ever successfully addressed how do we get black college students emerging out of these institutions. In fact, I begin this book by telling the story of SNCC's um, 50th anniversary, um, which took place in 2010. Um, on, at Shaw University, which of course is where student, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, SNCC, where it was founded. Uh, and I began my story by talking about the fact that I was there attending um, with some of my students actually from Morgan State. I had taken some of my students from Morgan State down to this 50th anniversary of SNCC. And even as SNCC was engaging in this conference, there were no panels at all that discussed where the overwhelming majority of these students emerged from, HBCUs. And so I, I knew that there was a gap there. I knew that there were, uh, there was, as we were taught as undergraduate students at a and there was a conference that we used to take at a and called Missing Pages. Right? I knew that there was a missing page that had not really been filled in on the legacy of, of Black colleges. Uh, and so I, I wrote my, my dissertation uh, as a comparative study uh, on Jackson State University and Tougaloo College, um, looking at the, what we call in history, the long history of these institutions, trying to answer that question, what did they have to do with the liberation of black people? And so when I finished um, that dissertation, uh, my, my graduate professor, Dr. Hassan Jeffries, uh, who was my mentor and advisor and a, more, a proud Morehouse man, I should add. Uh, um, he was the one who suggested when I was done, said, look, you know what? You should really try to hit the home run and tell a larger, broader story of black colleges and fill in those missing pages, fill in that gap about why HBCUs matter, why that space matters. Uh, and that's really where, where this book was born. Again, Shelter in a Time of Storm. In the book, I talk about seven different institutions, um, beginning with the Institute for Colored Youth, which again, went on to become Cheney State University. Uh, I also talk about Tougaloo during this period known as the Nadir. So again, as racial violence is exploding throughout the South, particularly the Deep South uh, during the, 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 the Reconstruction era, you know, how do these institutions exist? How do they begin to, to, to thrive and to create a space where young black folks' freedom dreams can run free, right? Where they can begin to think about how they can see themselves as agents for social and political change. Black colleges provided that space. And so I talk about Tougaloo, uh, then I talk about Bennett College, uh, one of only, uh, uh, one of only uh, two 
um, uh, institutions dedicated to serving a single sex population. Of course, the other HBCU that does that is Spelman College located right here in Atlanta. I talk about Bennett during this new Negro era beginning uh, in the beginning of, of 1900 through uh, the, the beginning or the end of World War II. Uh, and then I talk about, I, I deliberately talk about um, three uh, state institutions, because that's one of the other narratives, one of the other myths that have really emerged in the previous research is that, hey, black state schools definitely didn't speak out on, a, on, on white supremacy and Jim Crow, right? Because why? They were under the thumb of racist white state legislators who made sure that their professors were in line and the college administrators were in line. But yet when you look at the history, as I do, of Jackson State University, Alabama State University, and Southern University, all state institutions, what you find is an explosive on what I refer to in my book as a second curriculum, right? And by when I say second curriculum, I define that in three ways. I talk about race consciousness, I talk about cultural nationalism, and I talk about idealism as they, as they existed within these institutions. And when I say idealism specifically and deliberately, I'm talking about the ideas of citizenship and democracy. As I was doing my research, even going back to my dissertation, but as I began researching to the book and I'm looking through the old student newspapers, I'm constantly coming up on two words that are constantly emerging within the text. Two words that black college students are always talking about. They're talking about citizenship and democracy, which struck me as odd because citizenship and democracy are what? Two of the things that black folks were denied on a daily basis. But yet black college students were being drilled in these concepts, right? Almost in a, in a, in a militaristic sense drill to make sure that they would be agents of change, that they would be the future of a movement yet to, to, to come forth, right? Uh, uh, and so in Southern University, that second curriculum thrived. At Jackson State University, that second curriculum thrived. At, at, at Alabama State University, that second curriculum thrived. And so state institutions, in spite of the fact that they were under state control, they were vital spaces um, where Black activism and Black agency um, really sprung to life. And then I closed the book by talking about my alma mater um, during the Black Power era, uh, North Carolina Anti State University, as Bill Chafe, um, who's a historian who wrote an incredible book called Civilities and Civil Rights. Um, as he documents in that book, as he talked about the sit ins, uh, it was Greensboro, North Carolina in the late 1960s that really became the center. Um, the headquarters of the Black Power Movement in the South. And so I knew if I was I wanted to talk about that, um, and the, I had to talk about the reason why Greensboro, North Carolina was the center of the Black Power Movement in, in, of the South. And that was because of the presence uh, and the energy um, that flowed through North Carolina Anti State University. So again, as we celebrate February the 1st, we talk about um, the sit-ins and the legacy of the sit-ins. You need to understand that that is part of the legacy. And more, in fact, let me be very succinct in saying this, that the, the most important contribution um, that black colleges have ever made is transforming and reshaping the social and political contours of America. I'll say that again, the most important contribution the HBCUs have ever made is transforming and reshaping the social and political contours of America. There would be no civil rights movement had it not been for HBCUs. And this is not to diminish the significance and the impact of, of black churches and other black organizations and institutions. But HBCUs were founded for two distinct purposes, to train teachers and to train ministers. Right. And so, again, where do we get ministers from? We get them from HBCUs. Right. And so this idea of cultural nationalism, of building space, building institutions where the freedom dreams of black folks could, again, run unbridled, um, can run free uh, and that we could raise generations of young black folks who could see themselves as, as the future of, of this movement. That is what HBCUs provided. Even going back again from, from 1837 to where space was at a premium, moving into the 20th century, moving into the modern civil rights movement, it's the nation's black colleges that, that fostered these ideas of idealism and cultural nationalism and race consciousness that ran counter to white supremacy, that ran counter to Jim Crow. While, while white America is, is, is promoting the idea and concepts that black folks don't have culture, that black folks don't have heritage, that black folks are inferior, that black folks are, are lazy and shiftless, it's in HBCUs, 
right? That, that there's this counter message. In fact, as we talk about February the 1st, today also is, and we should acknowledge this, it is the beginning of Black History Month, right? Which started off as Negro History Week, which was founded by Carter G., Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And I made an Instagram post about this earlier today. Like, there would probably be no Black History Month had it not been for, guess what, HBCUs. Right, because when he, when it was Negro History Week, who did Carter G. Woodson lean upon to advance the idea of Black history and to promote the ideas of Black history? He leaned upon Black teachers. Right, he leaned upon Black colleges, which were training Black teachers, and so HBCUs became a space where this counter narrative of racial consciousness could emerge. In my book, I talk about James Weldon Johnson, who was a, a graduate of Morehouse. And I'm paraphrasing here, but James Weldon Johnson said when he was a student in the Morehouse, everything we did, everything we talked about, everything centered around race, right? Race mattered, right? And, and not in the sense that we were trying to say we were better than white folks, but what we were doing is saying that, hey, in this space, Black folks matter, right? So but long before there was an official Black Lives Matter movement, Black lives have always mattered at HBCUs. And that's, that's the most important thing that these institutions have been. They have been, as my book outlines, they have been shelters in a time of storm. And they still serve that purpose. So I'm going to echo what, what Dr. Mango said for all of the California students, right? Come back home. Right. And, 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 and come home to HBCUs in this space where you will be edified, that you could be unapologetically black, that you can link, link your freedom dreams to the freedom dreams of, of the masses. And in doing so, we can continue to elevate. We can continue to build and we can continue to try to strive to make this country a more just and more inclusive space. As I said before, that's the most important contribution that HBCUs have ever made um, throughout their history. And they continue to do that to the day. How else would we get? A Kamala Harris? How else would we get uh, someone like uh, 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 Ibram, uh, uh, um, uh, Ibram X. Kendi, right? How else would we get someone like a, a Ta-Nehisi Coates? They're all HBCU graduates, right? How would we get someone like a Cheryl Mango? <laughs> you know, so again, we're, we're still producing these type of critical thinkers who are taking on and, and, and producing um, counter messages to white supremacy. And, and I don't think I need to, to emphasize this enough, if, if ever we needed that type of message in America, we need it now, right? We clearly see that, that, that white supremacy and white nationalism and, and, and racial hostilities are once again peaking within this country. And black colleges, again, serve as a shelter in a time of storm. So for all y'all California folks, come on back home to the South. Uh, it's a short trip. Most of your, your grandmamas and, and, and your aunties and your uncles, that, that's where they were educated. Uh, so there's a legacy there. there. There's a continuum there. And I hope that you will continue to, to think about making HBCUs your intellectual home uh, as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Helen. I hope that didn't go too long. Um, but I do want to continue our conversation and raise any questions from the audience that, that might exist. Dr. Favors, you blew it out the, out the park. Thank you, sir. Just you and, and Dr. Matt, y'all just powerhouses. I mean, it just, um, thank you. Thank you for the presentations. We did have a few questions and I'm. you guys answered a lot of the questions that I think we, we had already kind of discussed. You, you, you brought it together so wonderfully. Um, but I do want to ask a couple of follow-up questions if that's okay, and then we'll go to Q&A. So folks, if you have questions of these two, amazing historians, these two professors of knowledge and excellence who talk about our meccas. I like to think of HBCUs as our mecca of excellence. Um, and that's the title that I use for this, this presentation today. So please start putting your, your questions in the chat. Um, Dr. Uh, McCord and I will keep an eye on it, um, but I do wanna ask a couple of follow-up questions. Um, Dr. Mango, was your creation of the first HBCU history course in HBCU studies, academic disciplines, why do you think those creations were so significant? Well, I think they were so significant because they were long, they're long overdue. Um, mm -hmm. I think oftentimes we talk about HBCUs, but we don't quite understand them. We talk about them as if we're cheering them on, that they're some type of vanity project. But they have real implications, not just for black people, but for the nation at large and the world at large. So I thought HBCU studies, I, I know oftentimes we might have some critiques or criticism of HBCUs, but I thought HBCUs, like we have African-American studies, LGBT studies, 
HBCUs have a framework. They have a laboratory uh, and, and a history and, and an experience that is that could be useful in uh, numerous professions, uh, whether it be higher ed, diversity and equity, political uh, political issues, government. Um, they're micro nations. So I thought that I wanted to go beyond just the creation of an HBCU history course. Um, I wanted to create a whole academic discipline where we can demonstrate how HBCUs are portable as investigational uh, apparatuses uh, that could be useful for uh, uh, the workforce uh, and useful for understanding and assisting them moving forward with society. I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Favors, you, you talked a little bit about um, the California connection to HBCUs. I'm going to expand on that a little bit. Many conversations about Black colleges center on their Southern and, and East Coast roots. What type of historic pathways were carved for California students to attend these historical institutions? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, when we talk about um, another very important theme in American history, um, that is the, the Great Migration. Um, too mm -hmm. often we, 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 we focus on that, that north, that south to north, you know, train routes that, that took black folks from Alabama and Mississippi to Chicago and to Detroit and folks from Georgia and South Carolina went up to Washington, D.C. and Baltimore mm -hmm. and Philadelphia and New York. And, and, and so and they were looking for jobs. Right. Uh, and, and so but let's be very clear about that. That, the, that tra those trains also ran east west, right? And, and black mm -hmm. folks from, from Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana and Texas, many of them made their way out to California looking for jobs, looking for, for opportunities where they could get the hellhounds off of their back um, that had defined their lives in places like the Deep South. Now, of course, ironically, what they found when they arrived in, in places like Los Angeles is that the, the hellhounds existed out there too. Right? And their racism was real uh, within the West Coast, right? I mean, you know, do we need to bring up Watts in 1965? Do we need to bring up the, bring up the legacy of, of police brutality and racial violence that made uh, necessary the, 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 the rise of the Black Panthers and other organizations? So what we clearly understand is that white supremacy is not a Southern thing. It's something that existed throughout the country. But what happens with those with those lanes, those, those networks being opened up is that black folks, when they arrive in California and on the West Coast uh, in, in the early 20th century and particularly in that, that post World War Two era or that during that World War Two era, they understand that, hey, when it's time for me to educate my child, I want my son or daughter to go back to Alcorn. I want my son or daughter to go back to Southern or to Grambling or to Texas Southern. And this is why we get that pipeline of a number of California students and other students from the West Coast who do indeed revisit and, and go back to attending HBCUs down South because that's a part of their legacy. That's a part of their heritage. So as I mentioned, as I was wrapping up my earlier comments, this is in many ways an opportunity for California students to come home Right, you know, this is a territory and an area which is not foreign to your ancestors. Uh, you know, I want to echo the sentiments of of what uh, um, uh, the the journalist Charles Blow, who is also a Grambling graduate, uh, his new book just came out entitled "The Devil You Know," and and the, yes. the primary the primary thesis of that book is that Black folks should think about coming back to, to the South, right? And, and so, um, you know, if you're not going to come back in the physical sense, at the very least, think about sending your your children back to attend these institutions, which I said before, are not foreign to you. Um, these institutions have been around for years and they've educated generations of black folks, whether you call the South your home, the North your home, or even the West Coast your home. Um, these mm -hmm. institutions have been a space uh, and a shelter in a time of storm for, for several generations. Beautiful. Now, we can't reiterate enough folks out there uh, sh uh, uh, sharing your morning with us. Please make sure you get Dr. Faber's book. Um, it's powerful. If you're interested in the context of HBCUs and the contributions, please make sure that you do that. Um, it's really an important historic piece, as I mentioned. I, I ordered mine, um, and so I'm excited to dig into that 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 amazing um, piece of work. So again, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Mango. Why do you believe California Community College students should further their education at an HBCU? Well. Um, Basically, I, I really enjoyed the comments that uh, Dr. Favors made. Um, but, 
you know, the South, it's a number of, of, of reasons why uh, the South and HBCUs in particular um, are, are, should be considered and should be uh, in any attempt to decide where you want to go to college. As I mentioned, HBCUs, we talk about a, a, a desire to have freedom and to have sovereignty. But I believe that HBCUs, uh, a freedom exists, a type of sovereignty for Black people exists, where you can, I don't care if you are a nerdy person, it's a group of, you have a, uh, you know, I'm a nerdy person, so I, I'm a, you can come join us <laughs> or whatever. You know, it's, it's a unit, just like we call it a university. It's a place where a universe of Black opportunity and black success and black potential is just cultivated. It's just concentrated. And so it's just a little bit of everything for everybody. We have non-black students, we have Hispanic, we have, you know, Asian students and they enjoy themselves. They, they do quite well. We have white students, they mm -hmm. do well. But it's because, I think it's also because it's a different type of culture. Um, the culture at HBCUs is a very warm, it's a very warm culture. The professors are very hands-on. It's not that, you know, we know your names. We know, we follow you. We want you to do well. We follow, my students still reach back out. And I'm not to say that this doesn't happen at PWIs, but um, at HBCUs, I found that the culture of the professors will get on the phone and say, now, has this student been coming to you? Wait a minute, let me see what is going on. What's going on here? Now you know better. So it's it has so what I say is we lost a lot of things in slavery. But HBCUs provide a village, a cultural village where uh, a, a, a makeshift cultural village that we lost in Africa, but you will find that in HBCUs. You will find that village mentality at HBCUs that we lost, where you have elders and you have the kids and you go through rites of passage and, you know, and, and everybody has a, 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 a cultural um, task that they have to perform. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, and we have, you know, ceremonies where we, it's very ceremonial like we had in Africa. It's very ritualistic like we had in Africa. And so, and you, and you get rewarded, you go through it, you are prepared as Dr. Favor said, to not just serve yourself, okay? And that was one of the differences with our African traditional education system, um, um, is that you weren't prepared to serve yourself, you were prepared to serve, serve the whole village, to serve yeah. the whole community. And yeah. at HBCU, Use, you are prepared to not just serve. Your degree is not just for you. Your degree is about your family. Your degree is about your your great grandmother who never got to get an education. Your aunties who were illiterate. Your degree is you get your degree for everybody. It's about the betterment of your community and the nation and the world at large. It's just it's just a different premium. It's a different purpose uh, at a HBCU um, and a dip that you'll find. That's powerful. That is powerful. Um, Dr. Favors, what's your hope for HBCUs? What's your hope for black colleges moving forward? Um, my hope is that they'll still be around. Um, as, mm -hmm. as Dr. Mango has mentioned, that they are very necessary. Uh, and again, probably more necessary now than they, than they ever have been. Uh, and so moving forward, my hope is that um, not only will they continue to thrive and adapt, um, but my other hope is that that they'll find a way to um, to revisit and 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 to recenter the importance of that second curriculum. I talk about this in the epilogue in the epilogue of my book. Is that and in fact that the epilogue is entitled the the corruption of the HBCU communitas. I borrow that term um, from uh, a cultural anthropologist by the name of Victor Turner. Uh, it's simply another way of describing space. As Dr. Mango has so eloquently um, outlined, um, HBCUs are built different, right? The, the spaces are built different. Uh, and, 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 and that space uh, and the curriculum, that second curriculum that thrive within that space, um, that is what these institutions have really been founded upon. That's a large part of their legacy. But moving forward into the 80s and 90s, uh, and one of the things, by the way, that, that really kind of served as the powerhouse of that second curriculum 
was the strength of the humanities and social sciences. And I mm. think moving into the 21st century and even in the latter half of the 20th century, um, the, the humanities and social sciences in some ways have been diminished on these campuses. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why I'm so excited to see the work of someone like Dr. Ruth Simmons uh, at Prairie View a and uh, who has really taken that campus by storm. Uh, and she understands it and she gets it. And she realizes that, you know, that, that the humanities is a part of that legacy. And we're going to make the humanities thrive in a place like Prairie View a and Again, this is not to diminish uh, um, engineering and STEM and these other fields. They're very essential uh, um, to making sure that HBCUs remain relevant. Uh, on 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 the uh, on the academic scene, but also I think I included within that is the necessity to strengthen and support and to fund the humanities and social sciences at HBCUs. And I really want to see HBCUs um, continue to work on that and to emphasize that um, moving forward because it's such an essential part of their legacies. Uh, you know, again, prior to uh, people like Cornell West and Henry Louis Gates and, and 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 Evelyn Higginbotham and all of those folks, but prior to them working at places like Princeton and, and Harvard, um, those type of professors worked at HBCUs, right? Uh, yeah. uh, and, 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 and in doing so, helped shape that generation of activism that emerged and exploded onto the scene. So, uh, and a lot of that changed in the 70s and 80s. As I said before, that the epilogue, the conclusion of my book really talks about how um, there was a corruption in some ways of that space. And so I would love to see HBCUs get back to um, uh, emphasizing the importance of the social sciences and humanities and in doing so, I think that would give them uh, the best chance to remain a viable voice, a critical voice, uh, as we see again, all these other issues emerging surrounding white nationalism and racism and, and sexism and homophobia and all these other concepts and ideas. Black colleges need to prepare their students to, to, uh, to be able to intellectually engage in that and to critique that and to be supportive of a more inclusive and tolerant society. And humanities and social sciences are going to be vital to, to doing that. Able to have that, absolutely, absolutely. Wow, powerful again. Um, I guess my last question for Dr. Mango, um, what's your vision for black colleges? Well, <clears throat> my vision for black colleges in the future is entangled in, in with my vision for African Americans in the future and for diasporans in the future and in and, and America, in the world in general, in the future. HBCUs, when you HBCUs have the potential, and I think all of us see this potential. And when I studied the literature, because I deal a lot with HBCU curriculum development, and when I studied the literature on HBCU curriculum, I mean, and largely Carter G. Woodson's The Miseducation of the Negro was largely predicated on what he saw was some flaws in the curriculum of HBCUs at that time. But, um, when we deal with when we deal with the potential of HBCUs, that's why I'm talking about HBCUs as micro nations. HBCUs have the potential. They have the Black Brain Trust. This is where all of the major thinkers, the Black thinkers, are. All of the and it's not just Black, but you know we have a diverse, uh, uh, a largely minority, largely diverse uh, 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 professorate faculty. This is where you. This is where uh, students are coming and and being and encountering ideas about race and ideas about uh, about uh, progress and about what is defining what success looks like, defining what the future looks like. What answering questions not just about white supremacy, but what does a world beyond white supremacy look like? Mm -hmm. So that's a different premium when you can answer a question and, and, and you encounter questions about how do you define the world beyond white supremacy? Mm -hmm. And so in the future for HBCUs, I envision them, that's why I'm try, I try to create, well, that's why I did create the HBCU studies discipline. Because I mean, I, in the future, I see us HBCUs intensely studying themselves so they can self-correct any challenges they might have and intensely having a system that studies society, a system, not just doing it haphazardly based upon, uh, you know, the, the challenges that, that, that people face, 
but having a system that systematically addresses, not just on the defense, but off offensively addresses and self-correct society and self-correct the nation and the world. I see HBCUs becoming emerging, moving to a, a new stage of development where they emerge as the victors of African-American history, the victors of American history, having a record of never discriminating against what other set of institutions in America have never discriminated against anyone. They have, there is time for HBCUs to rise and take their place as the victors in, in not only African-American history, but American history. And I see them as leading being a lead, having their models replicated, having their successes replicated, having their contributions replicated, not necessarily just the Ivy League and PWI. I see HBCUs when you hear Ivy League, the, the what you hear when you see when you see somebody's PhD is from Harvard, Princeton, and Stanford, I see that as the future of HBCUs. That when you see that on somebody's resume, you go, ooh, wow, yep. you went there. I see that. I see a victorious ending, as Dr. Malefiki Santi says. I see HBCUs with a, a victorious ending where they emerge as the victors who have yet who did not discriminate against people, okay, besides our own nuanced, you know, maybe color, you know, like light skin, dark skin. But who never really who who emerged with a clean record, emerged with a pristine, emerged as the victors in a, in American and African American history. Hmm. Well, I don't think there's anything left to say. <laughs> um, we didn't look like we had um, anyone with specific questions, Doctor of Favors and Doctor. Mango, but there has been some comments. Um, Dr. Karen, do you want to highlight some of the comments in the chat room? Yes, thank you. Um, well, the last one is it would be amazing um, based on your last comments. Uh, and Dr. White, uh, that the um, that HBCUs have been incubators of black excellence and an inclusive environment compared to that of PWIs and um, and that at HBCU black lives matter and they've always mattered. Um, also Dr. Parks mentioned that today is Langston Hughes birthday and Langston Hughes is one of my favorite poets can't even start and then um, there's nothing like an HBCU. So I would like to um, just thank you all for your presentations today. And and one of the things that came up for me, you know, when we talk about that trail from, um, from the South to the North, to the West, to the East, and then back, you know, that's a very important mm -hmm. part of our history and we for those of us who don't know our history to just begin to reflect upon our histories because my grandmother and my mother both went to an hbcu and life has changed um a lot since my grandmother born in 1901 you know um and the opportunities that are available and it's also um you know, and I have a granddaughter that's at an HBCU now. So, um, and and wanted to go there. That was her first choice, and she could have had many choices. And so, um, I think that our young people are getting it today and seeing the advantages um, and the opportunities that are offered um, for students at an HBCU. And um, with your presentation, if I was back in community college yeah, I'm, i'd be on my way somewhere yeah i'd be on and you don't have to take the train these days you can fly and be there in a couple of hours so um you know and californians are very much like new yorkers I, i'm originally from new york um we think that there's nothing better than where we are but we have to leave here so that we can see 
the opportunities and the advantages that are available and to uh, be able to be taught by extraordinary Absolutely. professors Absolutely. such as yourself. So, Dr. Mango, if I walked you so into much. your class and, and you started in the first five minutes, I'd be saying, can I take her every semester, please? <laughs> I mean, your love for HBCUs, it is so apparent. It is Thank so you. clear that you are committed. Dr. Favors, your time, your energy, your intellect yes. about yes. the business of our HBCUs is so inspiring. Um, I didn't mention, but I'm a doctoral student here in California. Um, and my, my research will be looking at HBCU impacts on African-American males in particular. And I'm just so excited to dig into some of the things that you talked about, Dr. Favors, because again, it helps to give me a, a better sense and, and, and foundation as I pursue this, this doctoral program. So thank you, thank you, personally, thank you. And can I just want to very quickly add that, let's not forget that Lexi Hughes is also a graduate of HBCU Lincoln College. So I just wanted to throw that out there since we were shouting out Link, uh, uh, Langston's birthday. Right. Lincoln Hughes, another HBCU grad. <laughs> and let me just say that the other way that our uh, California Community College students have benefited from HBCUs, and we have a couple of HBCU grads that are now professors in the California Community College system and the culture. And I know that when we were starting um, our programs to reach out to African-American students here in uh, California, we actually took sabbatical leaves and did trips to HBCUs. And much of what we did here was uh, modeled after what was going on in an HBCU so that we could be successful with our students at the community college level so that they can transfer and go on and um, be successful. So um, so your presence definitely is here. And um, and I'm no, I know Dr. White went to an HBCU and I'm sure there are others. If you went to an HBCU, just put it in the chat uh, where you attended. So thank and you. And also, um, before we conclude, I would also like to encourage you all, the model that you all have set up, you all have an a awesome model of, of, of uh, profitable every. I would suggest you are patent this or and you take it to state to state. I'm telling you, and start some type type of consortium with community colleges statewide. Don't just stop at California. Y'all need to take this all over. This is a this is this is a big uh, model Thank that, that deserves replication. Thank you. Thank you. So we have Morehouse in the house and Bethune Cookman. And she didn't put it in, but Fisk is in the house too. So yes, yes, yes. we'd we be knowing all your business just like they do at the HBCU, right? We're at one minute. And I'm representing uh, Gramlin for my sister and West Virginia State for my mother and um, and my grandmother and also um, Morris Brown College. Someone's was in the house from there. Yeah. Thank you. So we're at one minute. I, I'm, I'm a, I, I try to be a respectful of time and, and space, so I cannot thank you enough. Uh, let me thank a few people. Let me thank my amazing um, staff, the CCC, the HBCU staff. Uh, we spent a lot of time and energy making sure that everything was in the right place. Let me thank Mr. Ronnell, um, who is part of our, our adopted staff, but helps with the technical piece of, of Hop In today. Let me thank Dr. Teresa Price, who is my partner in crime, um, the uh, National College Resource Foundation, Resources Foundation, founder and, and, and executor, and, and helped us to put this week long, uh, this week of events, um, just to remind you, those who are still on with us right now, there's an uh, event happening uh, this afternoon. Please don't miss it. Academic preparation um, access means uh, e equals access. So make sure you catch that one this afternoon. And then we will be putting on these events all week. Please don't miss out. Um, if you missed it today and you see the recording, recording sorry, you missed a real treat. Um, but these uh, will be available on recording at a later date to share with people. Dr. Favors, in, in the African tradition, I, I bow to you, I thank you. Dr. Mango, in the African tradition, I bow and I thank you. Um, we thank you for your space and your time and your expertise. We hope to do this again with you. 
Um, maybe at some point we can all be together physically and do something in our presence with one another. We would we would pray for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Take a great afternoon's uh, relief and and thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.